Hello, my name is Kate Brown. We're going to talk about environmental flows, the concepts and methods that underlie environmental flows, and some of the advances that have been made in the assessments of environmental flows. I'm going to start by going through some of the aspects of ecosystems, um, environmental flows, their concepts, some of the methods of assessment of environmental flows, and then summarize all of that. What I'm hoping is that throughout what will underlie my message is the importance of this field of science to ADB's environmental operational directives, their new directives, which are to promote a shift to sustainable infrastructure, to invest in natural capital, to strengthen environmental government's management capacity, to respond to the climate change imperative. So let's start by going through some aspects of ecosystems. And I think when it comes to environmental flows, the most important aspect is that these are living ecosystems. Some time ago on the web, I came across a presentation by a colleague in India. And what she was doing is drawing an analogy between our bodies and the veins and arteries in our bodies and rivers flowing through the earth. And rivers are the lifelines of the landscape. They transport water that is essential for life. They connect vital ecosystems. They carry life-supporting elements and transport it to systems that will protect it. Rivers, aquifers, and oceans are interconnected and interdependent. They are multidimensional, and they supply nourishment for nations. But importantly, in terms of understanding our impacts on these systems, different elements, different velocities, and different flows are required to support different functions. So these interconnected and interdependent ecosystems are driven by and large by the physical attributes of hydrology, the hydraulics, the connectivity, where is the water going, how deep is it, how fast is it flowing, sediments and other aspects of water quality. So those are the main drivers of these ecosystems, but they support an intricate array, again, of interconnected, interdependent life of animals and plants that are dependent on the timing and the volume of these physical drivers through the system. Rivers of themselves provide a vast array of ecosystem services to people. The water and the food that they provide, I think, is fairly well understood. Building and other materials, sediments and wood, nutrient cycling and purification, flood attenuation, these global functions that are required, carbon sequestration, disease control, tourism and recreation, cultural activities and pride and the quality of life. None of these are small things. If we take just the ecosystems, services, food that is provided in the lower Mekong River, Freshwater fisheries in 2010 in the Lower Mekong River were already worth 17 billion US dollars per year. It's estimated that about 14 million water snakes are collected every year from the Tonle Sap Lake alone. And this doesn't account for a lot of the other protein that is coming directly from the river ecosystems in that region. Mussels, prawns, snails, turtles, frogs, birds, eggs, and then plants on top of that. So there can be no doubt that the functionality of these living interconnected ecosystems also provide us with a great deal of support. And that brings us to environmental flows or e-flows. So what are e-flows? They are the quantity, timing, quality of the flow of water, sediment and biota necessary to sustain fresh water and estuarine ecosystems and the human livelihoods and well-being that depend on those ecosystems. So they're not only about a minimum amount of water to protect the environment, a minimum flow. They are about the quantity of water, yes, but they're also about the pattern of flow, the flow of sediments, the quality of that water, and the movement of animals and plants. They are necessary for sustainability, but they're also necessary for promoting biodiversity, equity, resilience, livelihoods, reliable water supply, and I would suggest even viable businesses. So environmental flows of their essence are there to sustain and protect the systems that support us.
When environmental flows first came into the fore in the late 70s, early 80s, they responded to the need to spell out the ecological and social costs and benefits of water resource development at the same level of detail as was being done for the engineering and macroeconomic costs of development. And they came to, they came to the party to do this to provide information on options to enhance the overall benefits. If you're only looking at part of the equation, it's not possible to choose the optimal route forward. So the idea of environmental flows was to provide information that would allow enhancement of overall benefits and to avoid or mitigate the most damaging costs. So in line with what I've been saying about this interconnectivity, the main aspects of environmental flows are hydrology, the flow of water, sediments and geomorphology, the flow of sediments, where they land, where they erode, how they create habitats in the river ecosystem, connectivity, the flow of biota, both up and down the river system, but also laterally into floodplains and into lakes. So I'd like to go through each one of these aspects and just talk a little bit more detail about why they're important. Um, and I want to start with the flow of water. So what we've got here is a stylized hydrograph of a flood pulse system. We can divide it into its seasons, dry season, wet season, and transition season. And if we look at different aspects of that flood hydrograph, we find that there's parts of it that are important for life history patterns, for things like migration, spawning, or emergence from the river by aquatic insects into their aerial stages. These are linked not only to the changes of volume of water coming down the river system, but also to other factors outside of the river system, temperature, the availability of food once you leave the river ecosystem. So they cannot be decoupled from these without having some influence. That connectivity that I was talking about, both longitudinal, but as the floodwaters rise, the lateral connectivity spilling over into floodplains, giving access to areas with abundant food, with very quiet water and lots of protection to raise young. And variability, some years being wetter than others, promoting biodiversity, discouraging invasion at no point is the, uh, con are the conditions for one species ideal all of the time, allowing them to outcompete other species. So the very variability of those systems also promoting biodiversity. So there's many aspects of the flow that the river, living river ecosystem is responding to. And then the second of those two, the flow of sediment. Rivers are essentially giant conveyor belts taking the sediment from the mountains to the sea. They are driven by the slope and the amount of sediment that is in their systems. So eroding in the very steep sections up high and then settling out in the lower sections. It's no accident that when you go to the mountain streams, there are big elements of sediments, boulders and cobbles. And when you go to the lower river where it's much flatter, you've got sand and mud beds. But it's worth bearing in mind that these processes are driven by physics. If you change the amount of sediment that is being carried by water, you change whether it will erode or deposit. If you change the velocity of that water, you change whether it will erode or deposit. So if we're changing any one of those aspects, we will then alter the habitats that are available. Third of those three is the flow of biota. I think what comes most to mind when we're talking about the flow of biota is the flow of fish. That's usually what people are thinking about, migrating fish, migrating up and down. But there's many things that migrate, prawns, eels, birds. There's many biota that migrate. There's also a great deal of biota, such as vegetation, whose seeds drift down a river system, colonizing the lower reaches. So this particular diagram is of the Mekong River. Uh, showing that at any given time, there's a group of fish that are going upstream to spawn, another group that are going downstream to spawn, another group that are going sideways. So it's a very busy system in terms of the connectivity of the biota. So those main aspects are what we should be considering when we're thinking about environmental flows. And the reason we need to consider those is that human developments, including climate change, affect all in each of these.
Some time ago, in about 2003, there was a paper that came out on environmental flow assessment methods by, I think it was Tharm, Rebecca Tharm et al. Um, and they identified four main kinds of environmental flow assessment methods, hydrological, hydraulic, habitat simulation, and holistic. And those four uh, classifications remain by and large true today. Uh, there's also a whole lot of other methods that I here have called extrapolation methods because they are part, they fit within that, that uh, classification of uh, THAM, but they really are methods that are used once there has been an assessment in an area to extend that assessment. You can calibrate them and extend that assessment further once you've done it. What I'd like to talk about today are really these basic types of, the, of assessments, the hydrological, hydraulic, habitat, and holistic, and follow through how they developed and why they changed from one to the other. And essentially, from about the 1970s to the 2010s, we have a gradual trend in the development of environmental flows as a science, and particularly in the development of environmental flow assessment, from methods that did not consider ecology at all in the early 1970s, to methods now that look at the entire ecosystem and people. To me from methods that only looked at dry seas and low flows, to those that now look at the whole regime of the flow of water, plus the regime of the flow of sediment, plus the regime of the flow of biota. There's a gradual shift from methods that are prescriptive, this is what you need to maintain your ecosystem, to interactive, if you do this, this is what will happen to the ecosystem. So there's been this change over the last 40, 50 years that is quite marked, and it has been shown in the changes that have come about in terms of the assessment of environmental flows. And then the last of those is moving from a single location to whole basin assessments. So let's just look at a couple of examples of those very many um, assessment methods, starting with the earliest ones, starting with those hydrological assessments, um, the most common of which is the 10% rule or the Q95, where you use the 95th percentile, the, the flow that has been exceeded 95% of the time in the river. These are very early methods. They came about in the late 1970s. Uh, they're purely hydrological. There's no, very little or no ecological uh, content in them whatsoever. They were designed mainly to dilute pollutants, but also in the dry season where the rivers were drying up to provide some wetted habitat for game fish. They're a single number. They're incredibly attractive for use. Because of this, They've been widely used, um, and the 10% of average flow is a generally applicable hydrological average method over much of the globe today. It's consistent with the national requirements in many countries, and it's accepted practice in many, many countries. But if we go back to that hydrograph that I was showing earlier, and this is a less stylized one, it's an actual example from a river in Kashmir. What we can see here is the top line, the line at 3,000, this dark blue line here, that is your annual average flow. The orange line at the bottom, running all the way along the bottom, that is 10% of the dry season flow, which is usually, well often, what is put in place in terms of a hydrological uh, value for river flow. I think you can see from that line that many of the aspects of the flow regime that I was pointing out earlier no longer exist whatsoever. In fact, even if you move that line up a little bit, you still lose out on the duration of seasons, on the onset of seasons, on the timing of those seasons. Often when I ask people where did they get their 10% from, what they do is they refer to a method called tenant from the late 1970s. And I've gone back and I've had a look at the tenant method in several guises. 
And it's true, it does mention 10% of average annual flow, but it says it will maintain poor ecological condition. And I think having a look at that line and understanding how the river is responding to changes in the flow regime, one can understand why one might say it would maintain poor ecological condition. So let's then move to a second, the, the next one along, the hydraulic habitat uh, assessments. And what was happening here, mid to late 80s, what was happening here was that we we're moving now and understanding that we need to look at the river that in question, need to do field measurements, how far does the water go, what depth is it, where does it spread to. We, they used habitat as a surrogate for ecological condition. Um, and looked at discharge and hydraulic inflection points in the river channel. So what was happening is people were going out, they were measuring the channel, single cross section, creating a wetted perimeter versus discharge plot, and then looking if you drop the water as low as you could possibly take it, at what point did you really start to lose a lot of habitat? And this was assumed to be the point where we needed to keep the water to prevent that very rapid decline in habitat. Uh, the issues with this, of course, is that there may be more than one inflection point, and there's no detail revealed in the habitat. So the minute we hit a glitch with a, pro with, with a method like this, there's nowhere to go back to to ask, but why? Why do we need that? What happens if? And so the next level that came along in the late 80s, early 90s, was the habitat rating method. IFIM, PHAPSIM are the two most famous methods that are habitat rating methods. These are based to a large extent on field measurements. They focus on one or more species. They are very, very focused on different kinds of habitat, how the flow drives different kinds of habitat. Highly data intensive, particularly initially. They are today still the most used in the United States and they've gone through quite a lot of development in the time since they were first introduced. They are also interactive. So they will tell you, if you do this, this is what will happen. So we're starting to understand the, the importance of, of stakeholders, of people asking questions, not only from the perspective of uh, setting environmental flows, but also from the perspective of developing an understanding of how river ecosystems work. So IFIM, PHAPSIM, suddenly now moving to detailed assessment, detailed uh, data collection in particular river ecosystems. And what the, the uh, biologists would do, as I say, particularly in the States but elsewhere, is pick a particular river, pick a particular species, and then go out and look for that species, record where it was measured, what velocity, size classes was it found most in, did it like to be in fast flowing water or slow flowing water, so an enormous amount of detail. And then describing curves for each of these species for different aspects of their life cycle. So an acknowledgement of the complexity of the systems and of the life cycle of one particular species. And then the last of those categories that uh, were presented in that early THARM paper was holistic. And here there's two particular kinds. The, the first um, method, kind of method in the holistic method is the building block methodology, or the BBM. Again, it has field measurements, but it relies to a large extent on existing data and expert opinion. The reason for this is that the detailed information that is available for many of the rivers in the States is not necessarily available for rivers in many other parts of the world, but that doesn't mean we don't know a lot about them and can't say how they might change. The building block methodology is focused on discrete flow events, identifying floods that are needed, low flows that are needed pr to protect the ecosystem, and it's prescriptive. It says, if you want to keep your river in this particular way, these are the flows that you need in order to do that. Also part of the holistic suite of, of methodologies is drift. It also relies on limited field measurements for the river in question and focuses mainly on existing data and expert opinion. But it is one of the new suite of ecosystem models that are 
use time series of water, sediment, and biota flows to define how the river might change. It is interactive. If you change any one of these, this is how you might expect your river to respond. So I'm not going to go through the BBM, but I'd like to go through drift for a second because it comes back to this whole idea of the ecosystem being interconnected and being driven by hydrology, connectivity, sediments, and water quality. And essentially, that is what drift does. It is an ecosystem model that is set up for a particular river or for a particular basin. It is complex and everything that is, is linked, and it tries to link the most important functional links between those physical attributes and the biology that's happening. So if a fish needs to spawn and migrate upriver at a particular time of year, what happens if the, if the season starts a little bit later or starts a little bit earlier? What happens for a season when you have to lay eggs, have the legs, eggs hatch and have the, the juveniles reach a certain stage if that season is much shorter or much longer? So it is an, an entire ecosystem link, uh, ecosystem model with each link having a response curve. I can't go into the details of that in this session now, but what I would like to do is just show you an example of some of the outputs that can come when you start to work with this level of detail. And it has been done on many projects, and it's been done on many ADB projects. The examples that I'm going to give here are from a recently completed study on the Mekong on behalf of the, of the Mekong River Commission. So in terms of the kinds of outputs that you could get once you have an idea of the functioning at a detailed level are time series predictions, so of developments, of climate change. If we're, changing, if we're planning on changing the, 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 the flow of, of water or planning on changing the timing of the seasons as a result of development or as a result of climate change, we can feed those into the model and predict how we think the erosion will change, how we think particular fish species will change. It allows for endpoint predictions which allows for target setting, which allows for monitoring and adaptive management. And it allows for the evaluation of isolated effects of things such as barriers or sediments flushing or any of the things that become quite important once we start talking about water resource development. It also allows an idea of how community structure is going to change, which speaks to the heart of some of the social issues at play. A fisherman will tell you fishing biomass is one thing, but the species that are in the catch are incredibly important in terms of all sorts of things. So when we start to work at this level of detail, environmental flow assessments can provide an indication of how these should be expected to change, along with an indication of how the overall ecosystem, the overall feel of that ecosystem will be, which is important not only in a national sense, but becomes incredibly important when we're talking transboundary effects, a development that's put in one country that may well affect downstream to another country. And also, of course, important in terms of the in-depth analysis of options that is starting, thankfully, to characterize decision-making around major developments. A lot of the information for these in-depth analysis, of course, coming from the detailed, kind of detailed information that I was showing in a second ago. So, no time to go into the details of the methodologies, but really this understanding that from the 1970s to the 2010s, 2015s, we've had a growth in the science of environmental flows. We've moved from believing that a minimum flow is sufficient to protect an ecosystem to understanding that we are changing these systems fundamentally, that we know something about them and that we can help in terms of how these systems are likely to change, how they're likely to respond to some of the uh, uh, interventions that we make. So in summary then, what I'd like to just say is that coming back to this idea that rivers are living ecosystems, when you change one part of them, you will change another part of them.
So the increase in scale, detail, and accountability has driven an increase in scale, detail, and accountability in environmental flow assessments. The more modern environmental flow assessments are true to the complexity of river ecosystems and their response to development. They have been developed in response to a greater need for transparency, to promote capacity building, greater accountability, they're closer to science, they allow us to understand some of the serious trade-offs that we need to make. They support informed and equitable decision-making, increase awareness and understanding the dependencies on and functionings of the river, and are able to evaluate a wider scope of options, mitigated options, than the simple, let's just put 10% in the river and the river should be fine. We have used these on ADB projects to optimize design and location and to fine tune operating rules. We've also used them to generate metrics for monitoring, provide a resource for ongoing planning and management, and most importantly, in my opinion, to build management understanding and capacity. I think it's very important for all of us to move with the times. In the same way as the world didn't stop in 1970, nor did environmental flow assessments, the idea of a minimum flow to protect river ecosystems from all and every kind of impact simply doesn't hold water. Environmental flows are at the heart of integrated water resource management, and they are at the heart of ADB's operational directions for the environment. I think it's important for us to start using methods that speak to that. Thank you.